प्लीज ओपन योर बाइबल्स और यू कैन फॉलो अलॉन्ग इन द बुलेटिन दिस मॉर्निंग स्क्रिप्चर रीडिंग इज फ्रॉम रेवल्यूशन ट्वेंटी वन वर्स इज वन टू एट आई विल बी रीडिंग फ्रॉम द क्रिस्टियन स्टैंडर्ड बाइबल ट्रांसलेशन रेवल्यूशन चैप्टर ट्वेंटी वन वर्स इज वन टू एट देन आई सॉ अ न्यू हेवन एंड अ न्यू अर्थ फॉर द फर्स्ट हेवन एंड द फर्स्ट अर्थ हैड पास अवे एंड द सी वॉज नो मो I also saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband then i heard a loud voice from the throne look god's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them they will be his peoples and god himself will be with them and will be their god he will wipe away every tear from their eyes death will be no more grief crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away then the one seated on the throne said look i am making everything new he also said right because these words are faithful and true then he said to me it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end i will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life the one who conquers will inherit these things and i will be his god and he will be my son but the cowards faithless detestable murderers sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars their share will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death this is the word of the lord thank you ebenezer hey it's such a privilege to be here thank you for having me thank you blaine um it's been a wonderful time that we have spent in the middle east and uh, just a honor to preach god's word to you so keep your bibles open revelation chapter 21 these eight verses we're going to uh, obviously take a look at this this morning we're actually going to look at the as you can tell at the end of the bible Uh sometimes it's good to think about how this whole story ends. Now why do I say that? Well, because we're kind of in the middle of our story or of God's story, right? And it's not always easy our part. Our chapter isn't always easy, would you agree? And so think about this with me, friends. The one thing that unites people across history and across culture is that we all suffer. Is that right? whatever it might be and maybe it's chronic pain or disease or persecution or grief or anxiety or job loss or depression or financial instability the list goes of course on and on we all suffer don't we war and cancer and depression and relational strain and these things remind us we don't want band-aids we don't want escapes We don't want nice words and sentiments and hallmark cards. We don't want false promises. What we want, we want something permanent, don't we? We want new hearts. We want new bodies. We want a new world. And that's why sometimes we wonder is sticking with God, is staying with God through the suffering, is that worth it? You know in the Bible God makes some outrageous claims. He makes some outrageous promises. Here's one of them. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to this. Our light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So according to the apostle Paul, our current problems are light. They're cotton ball problems, tissue paper problems. Now, how can Paul say this? Is Paul so out of touch with reality? How can the glory of eternity compare to the suffering of death or or losing your job or cancer? How can whatever God has in store in the future for Christians make those things, those those sufferings not worth comparing? Is Paul out of his mind? He kind of sounds like a jerk. 
Well, friends, we have to understand something. Paul isn't diminishing our suffering. He's magnifying the glory to come. Friends, it will be so good. It will be so grand. It will be so otherworldly. This life is hard, isn't it? But the best is yet to come. And I wonder, friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that the best is yet to come? Today, I want to behold with you this, this incomparable weight of glory, this, this eternal future that God has for us. And I want to give you the main point, I believe, of this passage and this sermon in a sentence. So if you're taking notes, let me encourage you to write this sentence down. Let it serve you as an anchor as we walk through this passage. Here's the main point in one sentence. While you, Christian, suffer, cling to God's promise that he will make all things new. I'll say that again. While you, Christian, suffer, cling, cling to God's promise that he will make all things new. Now, we're stepping into a very complicated book, okay? But I feel like I'm kind of cheating uh, because we're going to skip over all of the crazy stuff and get right to the end of the thrilling stuff, okay? Now, the audience of the book of Revelation uh, are these seven churches in Asia Minor, and, and, and they had this one thing in common. In fact, they have it in common with us as well, and that's they were a church or they were churches that were suffering. And so God gives John this great vision or these series of visions to encourage these churches to help them to endure and strengthen them in the faith as they suffer. Now, here's how we're going to break this passage down. These eight verses, we're going to uh, we'll look at what, what John sees, what he hears, and then we're going to talk a little bit more at the end about application. So what does John see about this new creation? What does he hear about this new creation? And then uh, we're going to look at some application towards the end, okay? So let's first think about what does John see in this vision about this new creation? And so put your eyes on verses 1 and 2. Notice the first word, it says, then. Then, so what has happened so far? Well, a lot of things have happened so far. The apostle has had a dramatic, apocalyptic kind of vision where he sees the future. He sees God preserve the church through suffering as the forces of evil are growing around them. And most recently in chapters 19 and 20, he's seen King Jesus return to defeat and destroy the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And that's the holy, not holy, I should say, satanic trinity. And now King Jesus and his bride are ready for the new creation. So what does John see with his eyes in this vision about this new creation? Look again at verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, notice he sees the new heavens and the new earth. In verse 2, he sees a city bride coming down. Now this is the new creation. And it's been prophesied several times in the Old Testament. In fact, in the passage that Blaine read for us earlier in Isaiah chapter 65. The point being is that there's this great hope for God's people. It's not something a little better that's coming. It's not uh, mostly better that's coming. It's something new. It's something utterly glorious that is coming to God's people. Something so incredible that there won't be any more sea. Do you notice that in, in the first couple of verses? Now, I know every fisherman and surfer and water lover in the room is a little annoyed by this. This isn't talking about, by the way, large bodies of water. So, hey, you don't have to be worried. This is apocalyptic language. So the sea in ancient thought stood for chaos and evil. The beast in Revelation came out of the sea. The kaiju-like monsters in Daniel chapter 7 came out from the sea. And in Job, the Leviathan representing Satan came out of the sea. So no sea means that nothing evil will arise to infiltrate the pristine and the purity of this new creation that God has for his people. Hear me now, friends. God will finally and forever cut off the roots of evil. Your future life, if you're a Christian, your future life on this new earth will never be threatened. No evil, no sin, no entangling 
problems, no natural disasters, no wicked distractions, no sinister interruptions. What if I said for the next 12 months, let's do a little thought experiment here. What if I said for the next 12 months, not one bit of evil or sin would impact your life? Imagine the freedom that you've had, you would have in those circumstances. Imagine the joy you would experience in those circumstances. Well, friends, in this new creation, this will be your only and forever experience. The toxic fountain from which all evil erupts will be permanently destroyed. Can you imagine it? And then verse 2, notice, tells us that something from this new heaven will permanently touch this new earth. John sees two interwoven pictures. Notice, first of all, a holy city, but then notice also a bride. The new creation that dawns is a city, a a holy city, unvarnished of sin, dedicated fully to God. In the beginning, God planted a garden for humanity to live in. In the end, he will give us a city, a glorious city. And this city stands in contrast to Babylon, this detestable prostitute earlier in the book of Revelation. Babylon is an important picture in the Bible. What is it a picture of? Well, it represents a city that worships itself instead of God. Think about the ancient builders of Babel. Do you remember the story of Babel back in Genesis chapter 11? So so the people, they sought to join earth to heaven, but they were all motivated by pride. They figured that they could touch God with their own kind of efforts in building uh, an absurd project. John sees this new Jerusalem, which comes from God, and will truly join heaven and earth. Brothers and sisters, your future hope is not something that you can build or buy. It's something you receive by grace. In prior chapters in Revelation, we've seen Babylon fall. And the reason this, this, this city had to fall is so that this new Jerusalem can replace her. Because God's heavenly city brings life and joy and vitality and salvation to people. While Babylon, Babylon defaced the world and abused others. Friends, we live in a sort of Babylon today, don't we? A world and a people that are too much like the people of the Tower of Babel. And that's why we long for this other city, don't we? The city of God. But notice the city is also a bride. So is this new Jerusalem, is it a place or is it a people? What do you think? Well, the answer is yes. Option C, all of the above. The new creation is like a grand city with all the beauty and excitement and and spark of a bustling metropolis. And yet the new creation means the formation of a new people, a pure and radiant bride. Several months ago, Jenny and I were watching our uh, wedding video with our four little ones, and they were just laughing their way through this video, right? They haven't seen mom and dad like this. And, 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 you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to watch the kids watch our wedding. And it reminded me of something. You know, brides, they look their best on their wedding day, don't they? It's surprising to think of all the time a bride spends on her wedding day to get ready. You know, it took Blaine and I maybe six or seven minutes to put on our clothes, maybe eight minutes. Whereas Kelly and my wife, Jenny, I mean, I'm sure they spent all day wanting to look great for their husbands. And so it is with this shining city. It's the same thing made up of God's people. Notice. So friends, we are part of God's new creation. This is such good news. The new creation isn't just a new world. It's a new us. In fact, Jesus is the firstborn of this new creation. And we Christians who are united to Jesus by faith, we become part of this new creation as well. So, so we shouldn't be surprised to hear Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Same language we see in our passage this morning. Now, in a sense, the new creation begins in a small way, in a a sort of germinal way in our souls when we become Christians, when the Holy Spirit takes residence in us. It's, It's almost like a little pebble is taken from the new creation and placed in our hearts. And so all Christians together, 
spanning across the, the geographical expanse of the nations, but also spanning across the chronological expanse of the generations. Every nation, every generation, all part of this new creational bride. So friends, may I ask you this question? Have you been hurt? Have you been hurt by some form of impurity or ugliness in this life? Some defilement upon your soul, some unholy abuse, some painful injustice, something someone has done to you, or maybe something you've done to someone else. Whatever it is, it's painful, right? But then consider verses 1 and 2. Consider your future. If you are a Christian, God will bring his stunning and permanent purity and cleanness into this future, into this new creation for his people. So brothers and sisters, if you trust God, if you can hang on for dear life to Jesus to reach this grand city, listen, friends, no defilement awaits you there. No shameful snares, no evil plots, no unexpected pits. It will only be pure, only clean, only holy for you. And there will be no sea from which the serpents can arise. I can think of horrible things people have done to missionaries over the centuries, forced to eat despicable things, women like Helen Rosevere being violated, atrocities happening to children, but friends, we, the people of God, we have hope, right? One of these days, the tide will turn. There's a coming a day that, that, that it's not just a new set of circumstances, but a new creation, a new world. And the purity and the beauty of this new creation can give us the kind of hope we need in order to persevere. So this is what John sees about this new creation. Notice again, verses one and two. Now we're going to turn our attention to what John hears about this new creation, looking at verses 3 through 5. So John's seen a lot. In fact, this is the end of a very long series of visions, and the whole thing has been rather overwhelming for him, as you would imagine. So throughout these visions, there are these kind of clarifying moments that, that are punctuated throughout the book of Revelation, where an angel of God, or God himself, gives some interpretation and clarification about what's going on. God has to kind of interpret further what John is seeing. And that's kind of what happens here. Now, John hears a loud voice from the throne. In fact, it's from this great angel of God. Now, what else do we see as new about this new creation? Notice in verses 3 and following, God's presence completely infuses and redefines everything, right? Now, this is all covenantal language. God is fulfilling his promises to his people that he's made long time ago. Notice that word dwell. Uh, in the Greek, it means literally tent. And so in the Old Testament, God dwelt or tented with his people in the tabernacle as well as in the temple. And you may know this, only the priests could actually get into these kind of holy places where God resided right in the middle of the tabernacle or the temple. The people were on the outside kind of looking in. But when Jesus came, what does John say? He says, the word, that's Jesus, became flesh, took on humanity, and dwelt with us, tabernacled with us. God's back. So if Jesus comes back. Well, well, he's only here for a season, right? Where, where is God now? Well, we know he's with his people by the Spirit. But we also know it's not the fullness of his presence that we receive right now. That fullness is in this new creation. That's what we see happening here. Look again at verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. God will be with us in a full manner in this new creation. You see, friends, sometimes we forget what our salvation is for, what repentant humanity is being restored to. What is the goal of our creational existence. What are we being saved for? To dwell with God, to dwell with God forever, to dwell with God and his people forever in perfection and in glory. That's the goal. This is where we're heading. This is the driving ambition of salvation. The promise of salvation, listen, the promise of salvation is not just a better you. 
It's not just more self-satisfaction. It's not just future reunions with your loved ones. It's not just the absence of evil. The greatest gift of salvation is God himself. You will have him. Listen to how Christians exult in this from Psalm 43 and Psalm 16. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Friends, it's not just joys near God or around him, but above it all, joy in God. His presence is paradise. If you, if you were to go to this new creation and you had all this good stuff, right? So no tears and no pain and, and the full kind of human abilities of a new resurrection body and all your loved ones and friends were all there and there was no more sin. But, but Jesus wasn't there. Would he really be paradise? Maybe it'd be better for us to think about the who of heaven and not just the what of heaven. John Piper says this, the gospel of Jesus isn't a way to get people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. Do you hear that? I'll say that again. The gospel of Jesus isn't a way to get people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. So you've, you have God in this new creation. But there's more. Look at verse 4 with me. Let's read this together. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Here's a world we can hardly imagine. A world without sadness and shadows. A world without cursing and cancer. A world without depression and dust storms and death. Can you imagine this world, friends? And perhaps you've wondered alongside myself, why would God need to wipe away our tears if there's no more crying, if there's no more pain, if there's no more sin, if there's no more evil? Well, here's my answer to this question. I believe the tears God will wipe away are from the sorrows of the past. Our memories won't be wiped out. We will remember our sins. We will remember other people's sins perhaps against us or just the pains of this life, the struggles of this life. And so what I think verse 4 promises is that God himself will comfort his people and remove the sorrows of sin's past. Listen, friends, he's not only going to protect you from sin and evil within the new creation, he's going to comfort you from the sins and pains of the past. These are the tears he will wipe away. Because we live right now in a world of inconsolable things, don't we? We've all got wounds that linger. We feel some heaviness within the deep recesses and, and deep places of our memories. And as we recall certain events from the past, maybe a bad move or a change in circumstances, a grievous sin, a life-changing disaster, we wonder sometimes, will the pain ever go away? Will I ever not feel like this? Maybe it grows dull over time, but it's always there. This little kind of small ache, little splinter in your mind. Friends, those tears, every single one of them, God will wipe away. Brothers and sisters, let me invite you to find in this future hope, the very resolution you so long for in all of your tensions that are within your heart. There will be a comfort for every sorrow. There will be a healing from every disaster. There will be consolation swallowing up every disappointment. There will be resolution between every brother and sister that is unreconciled. God's comfort will be greater than every pain. And he will make this new creation in such a way where nothing, nothing will ever harm you again. Notice verse 5. John hears more. But this time it's not the angel who speaks. This time it's God himself. Let's read these verses together. Then the one seated on the throne, here's God. What does he say? He says, look, I am making everything new. He also said, write, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Kind of like the, the, the final riveting words to a great speech. You know, here we have kind of God inspiring and elevating and energizing and clarifying himself. God himself, God himself speaks directly to John. And he says, I am making everything new. 
Listen, friends, not some things God is going to make new, not just most things God will make new, not only the hardest of things, but even the most minor injustices, all things will be made new. And then God said, the Alpha and Omega said, notice, it is done. Do you see those three little words that God declares powerfully to John in verse 6? It is done. What is done? What is, what is done? What is he saying here? Friends, I think this moment is the climax of all history. Here's the, the mountaintop uh, experience, the summit, everything that God has ever promised, every bold claim that God has ever made. In this moment, he makes good on it all. It's as if God is saying at the end of things, dear church, my precious, courageous, suffering, faithful people, my bride, now holy and blameless and ready, look what I've prepared for you. Here, here is your eternal reward. I told you about this. I've been writing about this. I've been sending you prophets about this. I sent you Jesus to talk about this. I sent you the Apostle Paul to teach on this. And you trusted me. You trusted those promises. And here we are, finally. Now enter into the joy of your master. So John sees and John fears about this new creation. Now let's talk about how we relate to this new creation. Put your eyes on verses 6 through 8. God's speech kind of continues here. But now we hear from God how present humanity will relate to this future new creation. Look again at verse 6. Then he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Here we go. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But, but, the cowards, the faithless, Detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I want you to notice here, friends, there's two groups of people, two very distinct groups of people, those who are in Christ, who are people of faith, and those who are outside Christ, people that do not have faith. One of these groups is made up of those who have quenched their thirst in God, according to verse 6. The other is made up of those who are trying to quench their thirst in the wrong places. Verse 8. Friends, God offers all of us spiritual drink that will satisfy. And the thirsty can freely drink without any payments. Notice, there are those who drink from God and those who refuse to drink from God. Two groups of people. Notice one is full of conquerors. According to verse 7, the other is full of cowards. According to verse 8, so there's some who hold tightly onto Jesus for dear life through the pain, through the suffering, through the injustice, through the persecution, the gut punches. Only they, according to what God is saying here, only they will inherit this new creation and they will have God as their father. That's God's rock solid claim. In this world, we inherit things when someone dies, right? Someone dies, we might inherit someone. In the new creation, we inherit when we come alive. And God doesn't need to go away. But then notice, there's this other group of people, right? Isn't it interesting that God's list of vices, of evil, begins with cowards? Now, why is that there? Well, the rest of this what we see here is, is in other lists in the New Testament, so the sexually immoral and the sorcerers and the idolaters. You see that in other places in the New Testament. Well, what's coward all about? Why does he start with coward? Well, in the face of suffering, in the face of cultural pressure and persecution, the greatest threat to your faith and mine is spiritual cowardice. God knows this. And so he's trying to entice and warn these seven churches. He's trying to entice and warn us this morning the new creation is far, far better than anything this world has to offer. And hell, hell is far, far worse than you can imagine. For it's not only the beast and the false prophet and, and, and the devil and death and Hades that are cast into this lake of eternal fire. Notice, it's also those marked by persistent sin 
and rejection of God and his ways. Some will experience God as their father in this new creation. Others will experience God as their enemy in this lake of fire. Friends, this, the stakes are so high, aren't they? If you're not a Christian here this morning, let me address you for just a minute. First of all, I just want to welcome you here to Redeemer Fellowship. Uh, I believe this church is a safe place for you to explore the Christian faith. This is a, a friendly place for you, and I'd encourage you to, to dig in, study the Bible, talk to people around you, talk to your, your elders and pastors. They would love to speak with you more about this Jesus. But let, let me just talk to you. If you're not a Christian here this morning, let me just talk to you a little bit. Can you can you imagine something? Can you imagine anything that is better than the new creation that is promised in this passage? What would you come up with that is better than this? What more could you want? Is what, we, is what draws you away from God really better than what you see here? Listen, friends, the stakes are high for you if you are not a Christian. If you don't have Christ as Savior in this life, you will have Christ as judge in the next one. I don't want that for you. I want you to know Christ. So, so I plead with you this morning to consider Jesus, whom God sent to this earth to live a righteous life, to die an unjust death, on a cross to be raised after three days so that sinners like you and me can have this eternal life would you consider this jesus would you put your faith in him that means would you trust him alone for your forgiveness would you repent of your sins that doesn't mean you need to be perfect that you need to clean all of your life up that means that you need to break an allegiance that you have with this world with yourself You need to break from that allegiance and make Jesus your king. Would you repent of your sins? Would you trust in Christ alone? Would you do that even this morning? If you have any questions, I would love to talk with you afterwards. Blaine, the other elders would enjoy doing that as well. Let me close with three applications for Christians, okay? Three applications for Christians in this room. Here's the first one. Develop a taste for the water of life. You know, the astonishing thing about what is promised in the new creation uh, in full, what is promised here in full, is also promised by Jesus in the old creation. That's our creation right now, in part. Do you remember Jesus with a thirsty Samaritan adulteress? It's John chapter 4. He offers her living water, right? And, 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 and in John here, he offers that to us as well. And that's what we see here. In this vision, water that will truly quench our thirst. Maybe it's just a small cup in this old creation, but it's something, right? And when we sip in the present desert, we will one day gulp down in the future garden, in the city. The point is that we ought to be developing a liking to the water now. Because a little morsel now, a little taste now, was going to make us groan for the feast that's coming, right? So let me encourage you, if you're a Christian, drink deeply of Jesus each day. Listen to the words of George Mueller, okay? He was an orphanage director and a wonderful Christian brother. He said this, The first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in Jesus. Let me give that to you. Let me encourage you. Here's a man that was drinking deeply of the fountain of Christ. And Christ is offered to you, Christian, every day as well. You can drink deeply. This is why Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3 that that the church in Ephesus would be filled up to the fullness of Christ. What that means is you can have actually more of Christ. You can experience more of him and drink more of him. So let me encourage you to consider that. Number two application, hang on to Christ for dear life. Hang on to Jesus for dear life. You know, the proof of your genuine conversion is not that maybe you said a prayer 20 years ago or you had some sort of amazing spiritual experience or you seemed to feel bad about your sin that one time. The proof is in your perseverance. Not your perfection, but your perseverance. A life of repentance, a life of spiritual growth, a life of perseverance and endurance. 
Notice again the, the kind of the, the, the kind of thing that is commended here is, is the one who conquers. It says the one who conquers will inherit these things. And that kind of conquering that God has in mind isn't uh, violent or physical or political. It's, of course, a spiritual sort of conquering. And what this means at the practical level is this. You know, when life comes at you, when other people persecute you, when your own folly tempts, tempts you to flee from Jesus, it's at that very moment you have to do the opposite. The Christian life is essentially learning to flee to Jesus over the course of a thousand different temptations. Maybe you're going to have one of those moments this week. One of those temptations are going to come across your world this week. What will you do, friend? Will you flee to Christ or you, will you take a few steps away from him? Number three, the third application is regularly revisit this vision of the new creation. Can you imagine the first 20 minutes for John after this vision wrapped up? Can you imagine? That must have been absolutely mind-boggling, right? It must have had a powerful impact on this man. How could it not, right? He was an old man, but maybe for those last days for him, this vision must have been so sweet. Having seen what would soon become his. Well, we're of course not John, but we must find ways to keep this vision fresh and in front of us. And so let me just encourage you to do that. Perhaps it's meditating on this passage regularly or, or Isaiah chapter 65. Maybe it's singing hymns like the ones that we've been singing today that remind us of our future hope. Maybe it's reading books about God's future glory for Christians. What will stir up and, 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 and kind of ignite a passion for what's happening, what will happen, excuse me, in the future for Christians? What's, what's going to do that for you? Whatever's going to do that for you, let me encourage you to do it. Ultimately, we know we don't quite belong here in this world. Now and then we hear this kind of little voice in our heads. You know, the place you belong isn't a place you've ever been to before. None of us have truly been to this home, this new creational home. Let's briefly go back to where we started. What would justify the evil of human history? You know, what would make this world and everything that has been done in this world worth creating? What could warrant all the pain, the death, the disease, the rebellion, the wars, the wickedness, the sorrow that has happened in this world? You know, babies die, people get cancer, people steal things and kill people. People are enslaved to their own sin that destroys their lives. Dictators murder innocent citizens. And then there are the Christians and their churches down through the ages. The martyrs that have been put to death, the the persecuted Christians down through the centuries. Why would God create such a world with all of this in it? Well, friends, we may never fully understand what God has done in this world, but what do we know? What can we be confident of? Well, we know that all things work together somehow for the good of those who are in Christ, those who are Christians. We know that we can trust God in the midst of all of the mess of this life. We know that God mercifully sent his son Jesus into a world that would crucify him in order to save a people from that world and in order to create a new world for those he saved. And in this new world, in this new creation, friends, Christ will be all and in all. The light that will light up the city of God will be the light of Jesus his radiant glory, his blazing majesty is going to light up the city. And in this world, in this new creation, Jesus will bind up all our wounds. Jesus will satisfy all our needs. And justice and mercy will reign forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, we know these things, don't we? We know these things, and that should make all the difference. So Christian, you can walk into whatever God has for you tomorrow and this week because Christ is with you now and he will get you to his city. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we exalt you this morning as we consider this passage because you have sent your son Jesus into this dark and depressing world. 
You've sent Jesus into this world, and this world crucified him, and this world misrepresented him, and this world abused him. And yet he hung on the cross for sin, for our sin. We give you praise that in Christ, we, those who have faith in this Jesus, we will get everything that has been given to Jesus. That Jesus, as our older brother, who has been given this incredible inheritance of this new creation, that he shares it with his siblings. He shares it with us, those that are in him. We praise you this morning. I pray for those here who are not Christians. I pray that they would come to know you. I pray that you would perform, that you would do the miracle that only you could do, that you would make them alive, you would regenerate them, that you would take off the blinders of their eyes so that they could be saved not only from their sin, but saved from the coming judgment in the lake of fire. And Father, I pray for those Christians here in this room who are struggling, who are suffering, who are just trying to get through another day. Would you bolster them? Would you strengthen their faith as they put their eyes on this incredible picture of the new creation? Give them great hope in this new creation. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.